My name is Pierre. I'm the head of uh, engineering at Cambrium. And the amount of times in my life where I've ordered something other than a double espresso is less than five. What's up, everybody? This is Dimitrios, and you are listening to another edition of the MLOps Community Podcast. Today, I'm joined by another, none other than my man, Steven. Where you at, bro? Hey, how are you doing here? Dude, so today was some sci-fi type conversation because we got into biotech and I did not realize the advances and the type of cool things that are going on. Pierre was kind enough to break down all of the different initiatives that his company is doing and how it is helping move the ball forward. What were some key takeaways from your side? It was like, well, first, everything is related to beers. That's why, like, like, that's my thing. <laughs> we did keep coming back to that. Yeah. You just talked about, oh, this is how you make that. It's just like beer, except you change this molecule. <laughs> and then suddenly you have jet fuel, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but the main one is like, they have to do like some crazy thing. Is like, actually, I didn't realize that, you know, you could actually create proteins based on like, you know, he talked about collagen and like how they create it out of the lab. And I thought that was non possible, you know, and, and it was like, that's like, that was real sci fi thing to me being like oh yeah actually we can create it you know and then use LLMs for that not only that but how he has like an API that he hits to order DNA yeah oh yeah true and it's like then the week after they have DNA in the office you know in the lab and I'm like okay that's such a trip (laughs) yeah and he did mention I think my favorite thing was a lot of times we talk to industry professionals that are doing things and their constraints are hey how do I serve models at low latency or how do I serve thousands of models or how do I make sure that these models are constantly retraining. And I think in your scenario, what you're doing at your job is an ML platform that services data scientists, but the needs of these data scientists and the needs of your platform that you've created are much different than the needs that Pierre was talking about and the platform that he created. Because he is not necessarily servicing data scientists, he's servicing researchers, and there's different constraints that he was playing with, which is fascinating to me because he doesn't care about, hey, can I serve a thousand models a second or whatever it is, QPS. What's my yeah. QPS? Like billions of What's QPS. What's my type to token? What's my... <laughs> None of that matters. It's all out the window because what he is really constrained on and what he mentioned was one of the biggest things is these experiments are very expensive. So he has to make damn well sure that when they are going to do an experiment, there's no data leakage. That was one huge thing that he said. Like, if I have a data pipeline, that pipeline needs to be working because if all of a sudden we lose some data to the cloud and we don't find it ever again or it doesn't get through to the experiment, that experiment has not been leveraged to its full potential. And therefore, if we have to do it again, it is very expensive. So, That was interesting to think about from a business aspect, a business and ML type aspect. And then there was also this idea at the end that he talked about how large language models and protein AI models are so similar. And that was fascinating too, because he's like, yeah, you know, like proteins are, they consist of lots of letters because that's usually how we identify letters. And you know what else consists of lots of letters? Words. (laughs) And so look at that. There are some definite overlaps there. And he talked about how they're leveraging that and what they're doing with their products. Uh, this was an awesome conversation. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so hyped by the conversation. Every time, you know, uh, I hear him talk about the products they do and everything. And I'm always like, well, they actually do things, you know, they like, they use AI and it's not like, they actually create products They actually make a change, you know, and yeah. it's like always fascinating. So. Yeah. yeah. And he's so passionate about it. It's yeah, like, I exactly. can talk about it for hours and hours. And it's like, also passionate about beers. So. <laughs> that I think was my, that's true. Like my favorite part of this is just how stoked he is and how he really understands the impact he's making by doing his job because he gets tangible things that you can touch and yeah. you can experiment. And arguably they might make the quality of your life better. He's dealing with cosmetics right now but as he mentioned they have plans to go into other areas and maybe maybe in the future as he said make less harmful plastic 
for plastic that isn't plastic and that can just biodegrade, which would be awesome uh, for anyone who has been fed up with plastic. They know. So anyway, dude, let's get into it. If you are enjoying this episode and you listen to it and you think, wow, that was awesome. We have one ask for you. And do you know what that one ask is, Stephen? I think it's Shari to one friend. Just one friend. That's all we ask. Before we jump into this, let's hear a quick blurb from our sponsors. All right, let's take a minute to talk about our sponsors' weights and biases. It seems like everyone's working on large language models right now, but understanding what to build with LLMs and how they work under the hood can be tricky. Thankfully, weights and biases can help. You might know about weights and biases' flagship experiment tracking product, In the LLM space, teams like OpenAI and Cohere rely on weights and biases to train and debug their models, but weights and biases has plenty more to offer you if you're thinking about training, fine-tuning, or prompt engineering an LLM on your own. Weights and biases traces lets you uncover granular insights about your LLMs providing a visual representation of their execution flows color-coded by each component in the chain. This helps you understand each step your LLM takes on its way to generating its output, giving you a deep, nuanced view of its behaviors and letting you iterate and debug much more quickly. Weights and Biases LLM production monitoring enables the creation of custom dashboards to monitor your LLM activities in real time, including throughput, token usage, cost, latency and errors Mm, that sounds so good and if you need help getting started with weights and biases they can help too on that front they've released multiple free classes for machine learning communities like ours the mlops community teaching them how to build llm apps intelligently approaching prompt engineering and a whole lot more Whether you're a seasoned pro or just getting started on your LLM journey, you can find what you need at Weights and Biases. You can get started today going to 1db.me slash mlops underscore traces for free today. Get after it. 1db.me slash mlops underscore traces. Let's get back into the podcast. Dude, I see you've got a lot of ski poles and skis in the background. What's up with that? Where's the story there? <laughs> actually, before living in Berlin, I used to live in Switzerland where I was finishing my PhD. And so that's where I actually learned skiing. Uh, I, I think like despite the fact that I left the country, I didn't leave the passion for skiing. So I just brought the skis with me. Yeah, And honestly, I've taken them out once only. <laughs> <laughs> They're basically des- decoration now. Exactly. I'm guessing. Yeah. Which ski mountains did you go to? It's not supposed to be any advertisement for any resort, right? But like <laughs> the general Swiss Alps are generally a nice place to be. I've heard the French Alps are nice too. Actually, the yeah. one place that I will never forget about in my life when it comes to skiing is Chamonix. Yeah. And the valley. Oh, man. Damn, you're a fancy, fancy man, Demetrius. You know, I get around. <laughs> I do my thing. Yeah, no, the Fr- the French shops are also nice, but the Swiss Alps were like literally 90 minutes away from my door, right? So, Oof. wow, that is spoiled, dude. That is really spoiled. So we started off this call with me hearing you two speaking in French, and I said, I know a little French. I know how to say <laughs> "je suis France day." Will one of you French speakers explain what the hell that means? Because I just keep saying it, and uh, people look at me weird. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, claiming that you're French with like such a strong accent, I think, is probably like me claiming that I'm British with my French accent. So, <laughs> but it, like what you said just means that yeah, you're probably like high, basically. Oh, this you one. You spoke to me too much or something, <laughs> and then it's like yeah, I spoke too much, man. <laughs> In Chamonix, you know, at the top of the mountain, that's it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'm high skiing. I'm skiing high. But, all right, so we didn't come here to better our French skills, or at least I didn't. You guys don't need that. We came here because I want to know all about your story and what you're doing as the head of engineering at Cambrian. 
And I also would like to just start with your trajectory. You went to school at some point in your life. You got out of school. You started working. Tell us about that. Yeah, and that was already a pretty long part of my life, right? <laughs> I think uh, let's start with the basics. I was, I think I was born a big fat nerd. <laughs> I've been <laughs> nerding about science since like forever, since the first memories I have. So yeah, I studied classical scientific tra trajectory in France. Um, we have this system called uh, Grand, Grand École, right? It's like basically fancy engineering schools. Um, so I went to um, class preparatoire, which is like basically preparation for competitive exam uh, throughout uh, France. And then depending on your ranking, you can get into different schools. I landed into the School of Mines in Paris, which is actually not just about digging holes in the uh, in the ground, right? But actually, a um, pretty good school for like applied physics and applied mathematics. Um, so I'd say like maybe the the four first years after um, my high school, I just spent a lot of time uh, studying applied mathematics and applied physics and anything from like you know material science to nuclear physics to uh, the biotechnology, um, economics, and stuff like this. Um, the whole game was just like playing math too, but of different things, uh, which made me very happy. Um, and then uh, basically between my two years of masters, I uh, went to the US and worked um, uh, with Total New Energies at a company called Amiris, who was basically making jet fuel out of uh, genetically modified beer yeast, right? So the process was pretty fucking cool. It's, um, you take the same process of making beer, except that the yeast that you have, you remove the beer making part and you added jet fuel making part. Um, and we, <laughs> we actually managed to make it work to like, you know, like we're literally producing tons of quantities of this, right? And uh, my role in this gigantic uh, project was uh, only to make mathematical models of like how this worked, right? Um, so I was like, yeah, I think I like biotechnology. I think I like it because um, it's a really complicated science. Math never works to be said when applied to it. So I want to, to do a bit more of that, right? And then uh, I went to Switzerland to EPFL to basically get a PhD in that uh, field. Um, and I studied uh, there for like a bit less than uh, four years, got my PhD. And then um, basically, I think two days before defending, there's like this random dude um, hitting me up on LinkedIn, like, hey, we like what you're doing. Do you want to you tell us about it? And, you know, I'm an excitable scientist. I'm just like, yeah, sure, I'm going to tell you about my PhD. <laughs> um, turns out it was the first phases of an interview process. Um, and so I defend my PhD and then they called me like, Hey, do you want to come to Berlin to, uh, you know, see if we could work together? And at that point I'm like, well, you know, I just defended my PhD, so might as well just, you know, travel a little bit. Uh, and mind you, this was like in between COVID August, 2020. Yeah. Um, so I go to Berlin, meet these people and, you know, it's just like nice, fast, think fast thinking people that obviously don't know as much as I do on my particular topic. Right. But always ask the right questions. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just leave Switzerland and come to Berlin and try to make something with them, right? So that's how I was, how I was hired as um, employee number two at Cambrian uh, with, uh, at the time, the title of a head of computational biology. And it was just like uh, five, six people just living in a bat cave trying to figure out what we could do with, <laughs> with our brain and our technology, right? Uh, so that's how it all started. All right, so you were hired as like employee number two then, right? Uh -huh. And so then how did you go from like being employee number two to like hiring a team as well and being able to, to produce actually a real product? I think the the way the founders wanted to hire was initially to get basically the leads of their different departments, right? And then depending on like, at the time we didn't run a product, right? We did not even really know what we wanted to do. Uh, we just knew that we wanted to do something sustainable related to biotech and AI, right? Um, and so they just hired a bunch of people that basically could become heads of departments uh, in their growth trajectories. And then naturally, like as uh, our use case uh, clarified as uh, what we wanted to do became more clear, um, then basically we all hired um, our, our different teams, right, and different departments. So I'm the head of engineering. Um, so that means we do in everything in the related computers and robots. Uh, then there's you see the head of R&D, who does like the actual... Uh, who handles the team that does the actual biology in the lab, right? Um, and then, of course, you have like the finance and the biz dev and the sales and so on. So talk to me about what your evolution had to look like going from employee number two to now head of engineering and how that, like what traits did you have to learn? What 
is different about your day now than it was then? Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of questions to unpack. <laughs> I will start with uh, a quote that um, Ruben, my, my colleague, really likes to remind me. Like, I, I think at one day I was getting a bit angry and I was like, Ruben, I study computers, not people. I don't know how to handle that, right? <laughs> and so I think that's a good summary of like the 12 things I had to learn, which was like, when you have, when you're a manager, you need to understand how people work and you need to understand what are good ways to react to situations that you might not be prepared, right? And, you know, as much as, you know, I had some, to some aspects, elements of that training in my engineering school, uh, it's always different when you actually have, you know, people working uh, in your team, right? Um, so I think that's definitely the unexpected aspects of things that I learned, uh, but I'm probably also the one I'm most thankful for, right? Yeah. Are there things that you specifically like? I, I noticed with myself and having to lead teams, one thing I had to get good at was having hard conversations. And that I don't necessarily like to do because I'm all peace, love, and tie-dye. And then when you do have to have these hard conversations, it's like you cannot really, at least in my experience, I've found that I can't grow without saying things that are uncomfortable and if i don't say the things that i want to say it eats at me later on and then it just grows and so bringing these things up i've learned more and more when i'm with teams i need to bring them up right when they happen otherwise later on it's going to just fester and get bigger and become much more overblown than it necessarily needs to are there other tricks that you've learned as it comes to leading teams and leading especially engineers yeah in your in your tenure yeah i mean the point you made about like addressing problems early i think is definitely one of the most important the i also really dislike <laughs> uneasy conversations right um but as you said sometimes you need to have them and i think the best way to have them is to make sure that the person you're going to have them with is following the same journey as you have been following right like at the end of the day, you're working with these people, you've hired these people, it's for a reason, right? So like to some extent, you can trust their uh, brain power, their understanding ability. And so I think what I always try to do is like, if we're not agreeing on the situation and we need to have this difficult conversation, what is it that I do not understand from your thought processes? And what is it that you do not understand from my thought processes, right? And, once you, and it's really nice because it's a very analytical problem. So there's like no emotions involved there. Everybody just lays their cards on the table everybody looks at what's there and like okay this is what is disconnected and this is what we need to agree on right um and i think so far this this allowed me to basically handle most of the difficult problems we've had um at Cambrian. and because you know it's a startup so of, t- of course you're going to have like stressful moments you're going to have like you know high stakes decisions you're going to make mistakes you always have like this sort of situations that pop up and these are the situations around which nucleate usually the difficult conversations right but again, I think the first thing to do is like, you have to trust your hire. Like you hire that person is for a reason. They're clever. You have to understand what it is that you don't understand from their brain and vice versa. There is something that for me, it feels like when I'm talking to you and just hearing your experience, you seem to have a lot of interest and a lot of curiosity on many different topics. And so I would love to know how it went from like being in an academic situation where you're really studying in depth biotech type things or just biological things and then being more on the engineering side and needing to learn about the computers and I know you've studied that also but it feels like what are some of the learnings that you've had since you've been in industry that you can can relay also i think there's the general question of and i I think it's also like a stressful question when you come out of academia of how do you stay up to date with what's happening right um and especially not necessarily academia but basically when when you come from a place where you've been always at the bleeding edge of what technology can do or what science can do or whatever right like moving back to a position where like you have to you know manage projects and like talk to people and, and do podcasts, right? All of a sudden, yeah. you don't have the time to stay technically up to date with technology. Um, how to handle this? I think 
for me, it was a combo of still spending some time, you know, getting my hands dirty, right? Like, you know, when people talk about LLMs and so on, like, I am happy that I took the time to just, like, play with long chain, play with, you know, different uh, backends and, like, see what works, see what doesn't, find hilarious failure modes where, like, ChatGPT was just convincing me that it was alive or something, you know, like, you have to interact with the technology to keep your touch, but you don't have to be playing with it every day to stay at the bleeding edge, you understand what I mean? And so that's element number one. Element number two is like, you don't have to yourself be at the bleeding edge if you trust the people you hire to be themselves at the bleeding edge, right? Um, I think that's something I was super thankful for. Is like, my team is absolutely fucking insane. They're really, really good at everything they're doing. <laughs> and so for me, I'm like, even if I spent like 10, hour, 10 additional hours a week trying to learn what they're doing, I could never get to like 50% <clears throat> of what they're doing. So, for, so you know, it's not it's not even an opportunity. I'm just like, I let the expert do the expert things and I'll do what I know what to do, which is like talk at podcasts and, <laughs> and de-escalate conflict. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for sure you can talk at podcasts and everything, but I kind of feel like as well, you're still very technical as well at the same time, right? You like, you, you're you like head of engineering, so hence a manager. But also I feel like you still want to get your hand dirty, as you said, and you played around with LLMs a lot. So, so like, are you the one that already like, for example, pushed for the use of LLM at Cambrium or how did that came to happen as well? Can I actually talk about that other story before answering to your question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's actually that happened. Uh, that, I mean, it's true that I've act actively kept my hands um, uh, dirty and there's like one super cool thing that we developed at Cambrium, um, which is hard to pronounce, but sounds super cool, which is like a protein programming language. And I can talk about this in more details later on, but basically I think this is one of my um, earliest contribution. It was like at one point, like we're going to design proteins. There is no constitutive way to design proteins that, you know, is kind of just makes sense for everyone. It's always like a little bit like wishy-wishy magic. And I was like, okay, you know what's a good way to blend natural language and computer language in a non-wishy-wishy magic for, uh, programming languages, right? And so we developed like the first version of this protein programming language, which is like a proper compiled uh, uh, programming language, just Turing complex and so on. And with it, you can specify your proteins and so on. Nerd me was really happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> then it evolved in many different ways when I gave it into the hands of my engineers. I think this is, yeah, an example of how uh, in small scale startups like like ours, right? Like an engineering manager can still like have an impact in in shaping the direction of like the, where the technology should go. Uh, it's basically, I often build MVPs. Some of them die. Some of them, you know, uh, my team like and they basically develop them. Right. Um, what was the question I was supposed to answer with this non-answer? <laughs> it was it was around the use of LLMs yes. and was that one of your MVPs that you're playing around with? Yes. So I think it's yet another example of a beautiful discussion between um, two minds that did not agree. <laughs> um, so Charlie, uh, my uh, chief scientific officer, so he's the guy who's setting the vision and I'm the guy who's trying to execute and there's like this natural uh, dialectic that happens in between the two, right? And I love it. So the first time he told me, yeah, we should look into like, you know, Gen and so on and so on. And I was like, oh, yeah, just, yeah hype, Whatever. hype. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time for hype. Uh, but yes. then like, you know, again, what is it that he sees that I, that, that I do not, you know? And we, we took the, the conversation a bit further and then we saw like pretty obvious use cases, like three or four projects that came uh, from, from, from this initial discussion, right? Um, and then, yes, I was the first one to, to play with it. And then I just showed my team. So I was like, hey, look into this, look into this particular stack, look into these technologies. That maybe it can help some, uh, some elements of your uh, work streams, right? And, um, and so, yeah, we have a bunch of exciting projects that range from, you know, basically a LLM-based uh, research scientist assistant uh, that sounds like, and they can help us, like, you know, design our experiment and summarize our results to an actual proper LLM size type of uh, machine learning training for generating proteins out of nowhere. Right? Wait, so break these down. This first one, let's start with the easy one and then get complicated as we go along and see if I can follow you along <laughs> the way. You've got a Slack bot that someone can interact with and says, hey, I want to create something, whatever it may be, some kind of experiment. And can you help me? Is that how it looks or, or give me the, the, vision. the breakdown? <laughs> That's the vision. It's not <laughs> that small yet. Uh, but basically it's, uh, it's like a long chain stack, right? It's like document retrieval at the end of the day. 
So it's like a bot that you ask it questions and it's gonna fetch in, you know, our experimental data, uh, our Slack messages, our um, Notion pages and so on. Basically all the relevant elements uh, to answer your questions, craft an answer and give it to you. And you can ask it to, I mean, I've asked it to write LinkedIn posts for me, uh, you know, about like uh, our latest uh, product. And it's, it's able to say like, oh, your latest product is actually NovaCall and you, you released it in April and so on. So that's, you know, this uh, outcome. But then you could also ask it like, hey, what is the latest high performing protein that we've produced in the lab? And it you know, gives you like the entry and you have like the protein sequence and so on. It's just basically a very quick glorified search engine, but it's like really, really useful <laughs> for us, right? And that was, I think, like the first MVP we made. But I love that it's like what you said is like very quick and easy thing. But also I feel like that's what you describe is like what a lot of companies are trying to sell at the moment. You know, it's like their product that was like, you know, uh, it's rag, it's like a search engine and everything. And you're just like, yeah, it's very quick and easy. That yeah. makes me mad <laughs> that these people are l raising so much money for this stack. And I mean, to be honest, it's also like because the stack is really well made and I'm really thankful for the engineering that went behind it. But like when I talk to investors, again, this is the rage moment, right? When I talk to investors and they're like asking me, why can't we make like a, you know, B2B SaaS with like an LLM front end to just like give requests, I mean, answer the requ technical requests in biology to people. I'm like, so first show me how you make value because with like a rule of three, I do not see how you make any fucking value out of this. But second is like, this is not how you're going to change the world. This is not how you solve sustainability. This is not how, you know, you make things happen. And ultimately, I think that's what's important to me is like, we want to change the status quo. We want to, you know, solve sustainability at the material level, at least for us. And you, you won't do that with an app. And you feel like you are doing that because of some of the other stuff that you're working on. Tell yeah. us like about the things that you feel like are changing the world. Tell us like about the product and like the things you actually created as well. Yeah. It's too bad I don't have samples here, but <laughs> basically, yeah, we use AI to design proteins that end up being materials, right? So we're literally using generative AI to make a material difference in the world. Something you can touch. Something that is actually outputted and these materials are just hallucinated by AI and then you go, hey, that might actually be useful. Or <laughs> how do uh, the... there are a couple of intermediate steps, but that's the general <laughs> that's the general process. Uh no, so the first part so okay. Let's let's state some some cool facts. Um we have one product already. So Cambrium is three years old. Um we got incorporated I think in September twenty twenty. Um in less than three years we managed to commercialize a biotech product, a material bi biotech product, and that's, um, it's called Novacol, and it's basically vegan human collagen um, that you use for cosmetics. Uh, why is it important? Collagen is basically what um, constitutes most of, uh, so it's actually the, the most important protein in your body in terms of weight. That's the one you have the most of. It's what your Whoa. skin is made of, right? And when you age, basically collagen concentration in your skin decreases, and that's why you get like, uh, uh, wrinkles and Wrinkle. basically sad skin, right? Dude, it's so crazy. Somebody was telling me yesterday how, oh, if your joints are all fucked up, you should have collagen. And I am, yeah. I am a uh, vegetarian leaning towards vegan. And I'm like, oh, can you get it? Because they were like, yeah, you can get it in bone marrow and all that. I was like, oh, well, I'm not having that. They were like, oh, <laughs> exactly. make sure you, you know, you like go and find that. So I'm, all right, you you sold me on it. I'm gonna find where you guys are selling that shit later. <laughs> You're exactly how you put it in your knees directly. <laughs> no, but you summarized it uh, exactly right. Like there were um, people that were supplying collagen, but yeah, it all comes from dead animals, right? And admittedly, people don't want to rub dead animals on their faces. Um, so if you can come up with like a vegan solution, easy. Problem is collagen is literally an animal protein, right? So how do you do a vegan animal protein? And the answer is with genetic engineering. So we take the collagen sequence or a bit of it, right? And we put it into our nice little yeast and then we um, give them sugar. And then instead of, again, making beer, they're going to produce our collagen, we extract it, package it, purify it, and then send it to a supplier. And basically the people that we sell it to package that into a cosmetic and then sell the actual cosmetic product. I love how everything with you is coming back to, well, it's just like making beer, except you change <laughs> one step and then it's jet fuel or it's... Yeah, but that's, like, that's the magic of uh, industrial biotechnology. And I think this is also like something I think people trained like me have a duty to do is like demystify a little bit like um, GMOs and genetic engineering, right? GMOs are not just Monsanto. Um, GMOs are what, you know, allowed insulin to be produced without killing pigs. 
uh, GMOs are what is basically making the enzymes you have in your uh, washing powder uh, for your washing machine. Um, GMOs are like a basic building block of really important scientific progress in the modern world. And today, still, for most of the population, it is like, oh, Monsanto bad, right? And I think, you know, it's high time we move past, uh, past this because it is putting a break on innovation in Europe in particular. Um, oh. Example is you've, you're vegetarian leg- uh, leaning vegan, Demetrius, right? So you've probably had, uh, you know, these um, food-based meat replacements, right? Oh, yeah. which tastes like not meat. <laughs> the reason why is, you know, meat has some particular uh, molecules, particular lipids, particular proteins in there that give it its particular taste, right? So we have all the tools um, to actually make actual lab-grown meat right now. It's a bit expensive, but, you know, following the technological developments, the price will drop. The problem is the regulation in Europe does not allow you to actually commercialize co- commercialize this in supermarkets, right? There's a super nice company in Berlin called Formo. Um, they make molecular cheese. They literally reproduce the cheese molecule by molecule, and their cheese is really good. No animals in the process. They can't fucking commercialize it in Europe. And it's coming from a French person as well. Like you said, the cheese is good, yes. so <laughs> I fully trust you on that one. <laughs> and lived in Switzerland, so you know, it's like you've... You've tried and the founder is Swiss, so that's why I trust them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my. That's the other French oh, word. Oh, yes, there you go. Sure. So you're actually learning French now in this podcast. Yes, exactly. But just to finish the story, where do they commercialize first? Singapore, and then US, and then only Europe, hoping that the lobby will manage to actually make GMO more accessible to supermarkets in the, in the next 10 years, right? But that's basically putting Europe behind in terms of like progress with respect to food tech, right? Which is super important. Uh, in, again, in the sustainability context for the next 50 years. But also, like, I mean, you touched on, on that point, like, especially in regards to regulation uh, in EU. And, you know, we also hear it a lot at the moment, like, with, like, EU is trying to put, like, regulation in place for AI because, like, people are a bit scared that we're going to have robots killing everyone soon or, or whatever they think. And they really think that LLMs are not the end of the world. Uh, but is it, like, has it had an impact, for example, for Cambrium on like different things, you know, different products you wanted to try, maybe different products you wanted to to build. As like regulation, you feel like slowed slowed you down a bit, maybe in the process. It did not slow us down, but it's definitely a bunch of constraints we took into account when we decided our trajectory product wise, right? Because we're not going to make cosmetics for the for for the rest of like, uh, our lives, right? Like the idea is like you start with markets that have a high innovation uh, potential, and also like a high price elasticity. And then we have a bunch of markets, including cosmetics there. And then the idea is like, as your technology becomes more mature, your cost of production decreases, then you work your way down to actually replacing plastics, right? Um, one question we got a lot at the beginning is like, why don't you do biomedical? Uh, or like, you know, uh, medical devices and so on. And the answer here is like, regulation makes it so that the life cycle of your first product is at least going to be five, eight years before you actually get to market, right? With the funding we have in the Europe, in Europe, you can't survive a startup for five, eight years. Like this, it's unless you have like special special incubators, special investors, it's really complicated, right? So we went for cosmetics, and again, I think it's really important to stress how cosmetics is such an interesting industry, right? Because it's it's not quite medical, but it still has like medical implications. It's not as heavily regulated as again like uh, medical and so on. So that allows you to have faster products, uh, faster uh, product life cycles. But also it's just like, it's always so hungry for innovation because it's the main motto of the main engine of their marketing campaign, right? Um, like there's this stat that basically every two years you have like a new hero ingredient, you know, like a hyaluronic acid, Jojo Bauer, la, 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 la. It's such a beautiful place to innovate. And it's also the industry that did save biotechnology uh, after the oil crash in 2015, right? When everybody was doing, um, again, bio jet fuel, bio oil and so on, um, back in my days in, you know, 2015. And then all of a sudden the, price of the oil barrel crashed below $60 a, a barrel, right? Then what happened? BP just sold their biotech division. So did, um, I don't want to miss mouth, so I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going <laughs> to give out the names. Act check you. Uh, some other big. I'm name. pretty sure <laughs> Total was the last one to, to get rid of, uh, of their biofuel, uh, biofuel um, project, right? And then basically what did the biofuel companies turn towards? Cosmetics was the only viable option. And you know why? In particular, for the case of um, the jet fuel we are making, if you take two molecules of jet fuel, put it like this, and join them, boom, you get a cosmetic product called squalene. Yeah. 
but it was beer. <laughs> I was like, damn, we can make beer. <laughs> beer like this. <laughs> no, you take gel shield, gel shield, put them together, and you have like Hini Squalene, uh, which is a really good cosmetic product, again, for your skin. And what is the main source of squalene in the world? Sharks. People are just fishing sharks, yeah. cutting them from their liver, pressing the liver, and putting that back in the sea. Really unsustainable. And all of a sudden, you can take jet fuel, make cosmetics out of it. And that's how Amiris uh, managed to survive um, the jet fuel crash, right? Fortunately, did not survive the second Biotech winter, which um, made them actually get bankrupt, I think, two months ago. <laughs> oh. Uh, which is kind of sad, because it's like, honestly, one of the flagship biotechs um, that really were showing the example of like how to do things uh, in the last years. So you say there is a second biotech winter. Or does that mean that we're in one right now? If they just crashed, what is it? What is the second biotech? I'm not winter? an economic analyst. Okay, so like take my words with like, <laughs> but like basically, yeah, the the general crash of the price of oil in in 2015 killed a lot of biotechs, and then basically what happened between COVID and Ukraine war and so on, like also a lot of biotechs just like uh, bit the dust, right? This is a very, it's a very difficult uh, climate for us because, again, because we're doing material stuff, you have really high capex. You have like, you literally have to buy robots, machines, land, right? So these are like difficult investments when you're a VC that's used to, you know, again, like car prices. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of, you know, biotech startups and scale ups haven't really easily survived the last two, three years. We managed. <laughs> Yeah, because also you have a product. I mean, you have like a product that is working, uh, but also like you just mentioned, you know, like you need to buy robots. You need to, to have like a lot of investment first. So it's also like when you use LLMs, you know, you're going to try to put it into production. I mean, we're talking at the MLOps community podcast. So usually you try to put it into production and you might have, you might make errors, you know, and then if you have a SaaS product, then I mean, it's, it's fine, you know, like your client won't be happy, but I guess for you, the cost of error is very different, right? Yeah. And so I think there are two dimensions. There's like, what is the cost of error of just having your service not working, right? And what is the cost of error of like having wrong predictions from uh, your machine learning algorithms and you know, LLMs? For us, as you were mentioning the materials earlier, like we don't need a low lat latency service serving like millions of people. Who are our customers? As the engineering team, the customers are our scientists, as you know, literally people we drink beer with and our friends with. So you know, if the service is down, they're not going to insult us, and they're definitely not going to go to a competitor. Uh, they're going to slack us like, hey, can you just make sure that whatever the gene sequencing service is up again? Um, and that's nice because basically that makes the constraints or on our um, operations much lower, right? Like you don't need an incre like a crazy infrastructure team to make sure that everything is um, working like that um, sorry, 24-7 and so on. You know, your service is down just like we started. That's nice. Yeah, but then also like, I mean, it's like you create proteins. So, I mean, I have, I have no background in biology, so I'm going to ask stupid questions, but so you create, you create proteins and like, maybe you create a wrong protein or like something like that. So like, can, like, can that happen for example? And then in the end, your product might not be as good or might be like, maybe and you create jet fuel again. Yeah, or you create bitter. <laughs> the, the wrinkles that adds to them. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a very good point. That's basically the second part of the question and arguably the more interesting ones. Like what is the cost of failure, right? And again, Counter example, imagine we are in the medical field. We are making proteins that are supposed to cure a disease, right? And your protein fucks up. Something is not good and you know, you're know you having adverse reactions. The cost of failure here is really high because you're going to have patients that are not going to be cured, right? For us, our protein issue doesn't perform means like, you know, whatever material we're making lab is not from like, maybe just like the thing we're testing, just like breaks and we're sad. Cost of failure, very low. I mean, sure, it's like there's some money, but like no life stakes or anything. Um, again, like in our configuration, what these machine learning models and general computation is good at is de-risking experiments, right? We come from a place where like without computers, we're making a lot of experiments and maybe, you know, 1% is successful. And if you, we use computers, including machine learning LLMs and so on, like all of a sudden we manage to like crank up to like 10% success, 50% success, 75% success. And that's just like save money, right? So for us, the cost, the cost of failure is very minimal and the gain that all these computation and operations can bring is definitely massive. And that's also how we managed to basically um, take a product to market to in, in less than two years, right? So also, I don't know if I mentioned this, but that, that's the absolute record, at least in the EU biotechs, and I think also in um, US biotechs. Why is it that we managed to go that fast? Because like every single checkpoint, every single um, 
yeah, verification step, we one shot because everything was there is in the computer, right? And that's also the power of um, of AI for us. So you mentioned that there's not the constraints that you have when it comes to like serving super low latency or millions of requests per second or trillions of requests per second, that type of thing. But there are different constraints that you have. So what are those constraints and what is what are you butting your head up against and trying to figure out like the engineering problems that you're encountering? Um, I think the, the biggest salient point is the price of data, right? Like a single biological experiment costs so much money that every single data point you can have, you want to save, right? And so if you have a pipeline that fails and like, you know, data disappears in the in, in the cloud limbo, that's actually pretty dramatic. Um, so I think this is the one thing on which we are really pent up is like making sure that we don't lose any form of data. Uh, and then, you know, of course, because your data is so important, you also want to make sure that you have the right data models. And that takes back to the problem of like, you know, the data sources, right? And then you have basically two types of data sources in, uh, in our situation. One is... Um, the real machines, right? And that's, you know, ugly CSVs you can pass and then you're good. And the other is basically the experimental notes of um, our scientists. And I think this is something, especially in biology, we've seen the curriculum uh, in universities has been a bit um, delayed in uh, uptaking, you know, the digitalization of processes and so on. And so training scientists to think in a data-driven way takes time. And it's really key to actually instrumentalizing a whole machine learning stack, right? Like if your data source is not, is not uh, you can't trust it, then your machine learning stack is not, is not going to produce anything interesting, right? Um, and so I think, of course, when we hire our scientists, we make sure that they have the right mindset, but also like just adop uh, adopting your uh, lab practices to this mindset. And, you know, it's as simple, it's as, I don't want to say dumb, but like as simple in, co in, in concept as, you know, you're pipetting things, but you have to type stuff on your computer to say how much you pipetted. How do you handle this? You know? And the answer is like, you have to bring robots so that you can free the hands of the scientists so that the scientists would say, like, this is the, um, this is the settings I've said, and then let the robot, the robot do the thing and so on. And so all of a sudden you have like all this conflation of a data-driven paradigm that changes your way of hiring, changes your way of con uh, conceiving your lab and changes the way you do experiments. And then you have to teach all your um, scientists to like, thinking this way, that has like a non-zero, um, I would say, learning debt, right? And this is something you have to take into account. And it's also a bunch of companies trying to solve this problem. But there's definitely, there's definitely a problem that's not solved. And I'm going to add, we were lucky because we were building something from nothing. So you could hire the right people. But when you are a gigantic biotech company, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give names, but there's a bunch in, you know, <laughs> in, in Berlin, in Europe in general. You have your team of like you know several hundreds of scientists, and you have they have twenty years of paper notebooks where, with the experimental data in there. What is the price of like digitalizing this? What is the price of like training these people with their habits into a data driven paradigm? The answer is like ginormous, and so that's why they're actually spending a ton of money trying to get this done. And that's also where us, the little agile startups, we can actually make uh, our way and basically beat them sometimes. So one thing that's fascinating that you said at the beginning there is that the price of an experiment is so expensive what makes it so expensive is it just the computational cost no it's really like ordering dna is expensive <laughs> handling dna is expensive robots are expensive consumables are expensive and you would not expect but also building our lab during the COVID times uh, there was a general um competition between the COVID testing centers that needed basically the same uh supplies as we did and then you have also like, you know, an increase in um, in the price of the supplies. It's all right. This is like, it's all, it's all sci-fi tech. So it's all expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's like you just you just said like you order DNA for example or something. Where I was like, yeah, you, you get it like on, you know, you get it on the order. Sure, you get it on the vault, and yeah, you have it on your door. <laughs> it's actually, it's actually both easy and difficult at the same time. But yeah, I mean, we we have an API to order our DNA. So like, <laughs> we we have. We have a machine learning algorithm that's like cranks up CSVs and just like send them through the API and then we get the DNA in the in the post office like a week after. That's that is <laughs> sci-fi. Yeah, that's like <laughs> dude, well let's talk a little bit about large language models versus protein models and how you see them being similar and different at the same okay. time. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with my favorite analogy. Um 
proteins are basically an assembly of a bunch of building blocks. These building blocks are called amino acids. And you might you might remember this from biology in high school or somewhere in the book. These building blocks, these amino acids, they all they have like 20 of them, so we usually uh, match them to a letter. If you look at this under this uh, under this angle, basically a protein is a string of different letters. What else is a string of different letters? Natural language, right? And so the same way, if you just take letters of the English alphabet, randomly put them together, you have very few, ch very little chances of actually getting an English word, even fewer chances to uh, get like you know a proper poem or like a proper essay, right? It's exactly the same with protein. Oh, shit. If you take these amino acids, put them together randomly, you just get like a spaghetti ball, maybe a yummy one, but you know, nothing, nothing will come out of it. <laughs> but if you're very smart, or like if you know the inner grammar syntax of this protein language, you can put them together so you can, you can get function. You can get the function that gives the keratin in your hair, the flexibility, the function that gives the elastin in your skin, the elasticity, the function that gives hemoglobin in your blood, the oxygen carrying capacity, right? And that's the whole challenge, and it's been the challenge of, bio, of protein engineering for maybe 60 years, right? It's like to understand a little bit this um, syntax and this grammar. And so there was a bunch of like uh, breakthroughs. Uh, one is AlphaFold, then you might have heard of uh, in 2018 and then 2020. But basically from the string of letter, we were, we were able to predict with a reasonable chance of success the shape of the protein. And shape is very close to the function of the protein, right? So. That was good. We could proofread a little bit our manuscripts if you want with the technology. Um, and what generative AI in proteins is bringing us now, and I'm talking about technology we're using now, right? We can ask machine learning models to write and say for us, to write the protein for us, to generate the protein for us with particular functionalities. And that's that's definitely an enabling technology that actually took us to the next level in terms of like capacity to create, the capacity to engineer new things and materials for the future. And so, yeah, that's basically the technology we're developing and working uh, with right now. Okay, so so like you mentioned, like you know, you have your technology and your product that that is now outside, like it's out in the world. Have you used like LLMs to be like, okay, I want to create a protein that is going to remove wrinkles from people, and then the LLM is like, okay, here it is, it's the shape. So, Novacol was developed before the big LLM boom. So it was basically like a younger version of this. It was using the protein programming language. But basically what we said is like, okay, here are a bunch of like options you have. We want a block that has this property. We want a flexible block here. And then we want this optimized for a bunch of, um, of constraints, including we want a peptide that is not um, allergenic. We want something that's compatible with the formulation pH of the creams. We want something that has um, maximized um, potency and effect and so on and so forth. Right. So it was not a, quite an LLM yet, but we already had a language to transform the design of this protein into a mathematical problem, which pretty sure nobody else had uh, then. <laughs> yeah, because that's what I was going to ask. Is like it seems like that's the key basically to the success. But also like was like not like big companies, you know, have that like something similar to be like yeah, we want we want something that is like no allergies, you know, everything. Like, is it because that like the project and language that you have, like that's basically the secret to yeah. the success. I think it allowed us to sift through orders of magnitude, 10, 10 to the 18 different uh, possible proteins, right? And we got like, you know, like a top 100. And out of the top 100, we tried maybe a bunch in the lab and then that's where we got a product from, right? Without this technology that we use in order to choose the right sequence that has like the right properties, for sure we would not have one shot it the feasibility case like you know from like scalability of our protein to like uh proper behavior on the skin and so on um so in in that sense not answering the LLM question yet but in that sense like the computation really was what's uh enabled us to basically uh be ahead of the game and now we are using LLMs for our next product which i can't talk too much about but basically okay. it is yeah, obviously it is getting to what you're saying we're using like daily in type of uh, diffusion models to just like make proteins that particular properties that we can code in mathematical uh, loss functions. And, <laughs> and it's really cool. Like you can really see the protein coming out of like a blur of atoms and folding together. It's really, really exciting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's that like, is yeah. way different than what I would have ever expected you to say on this call. That seems like, again, total sci-fi stuff. And you did mention how you're like, all right, we start with some cosmetic products, eventually we want to get to 
regenerating plastic but not plastic like a i guess non-harmful plastic non-harmful for the environment plastic is that the goal the ultimate goal or is that just like you see a vision of going towards things that are trying to help the planet more. Uh, not saying that the the vegan collagen isn't helping the planet, because as you are talking to somebody that is in a, a vegetarian, I understand how like not doing anything to animals is very helpful for the planet. But it feels like there you you kind of have in your head a bit of a a roadmap of where yeah. you want to go and this again like a lot of this one map is sort of confidential right but like the general idea is very accessible it's like what are the intermediate markets that get you from like specialty high price chemicals to like commodity low price chemicals right? and there's a bunch of like stuff that's in between um but yeah ultimately i mean i'm always using the example of plastics because they are everywhere right also in this fake leather jacket but you have a bunch of like uh, materials that people rarely think about that are actually pretty unsustainable. Um, one is concrete. Concrete creates a shit ton of CO2 every time you, you, you prepare it, right? There's also like really cool biotech uh, companies that make chemicals out of the CO2 emanation of concrete production. Uh, that's not what we do, but like, is that uh, really cool people doing this? So yeah, you, you want to display this, but you know, you can't like sample size. You, you talk to a concrete company, they're like, oh, we need samples to make tests. Can you make us a hundred kilograms of proteins? And the question is like, fuck no, that's <laughs> too expensive, right? Uh, so you need, you need something to bridge uh, in between. An interesting case that I learned about, um, well, the camera was like glues, glues to stick things together. That's so complicated, also so unsustainable. And there's like this uh, use case that we love talking about because we can, we can never we can never make it happen. But like space glue, so sticking things in space. Why is it a problem, and why is it not sustainable? <laughs> when you glue things together, when you glue your glue dries up, cures, it outgasses a bunch of things, right? And these things that it outgasses very often not really good for your health. Um, so now imagine you're in a tin can outside in space, and you have outgas of something that's not really good for your health. Pretty bad, right? Proteins are actually really good glues. Um, the muscle, like the, the thing you can eat, or at least we eat it in France, has some of the best animal glue you can find uh, in the world to actually stick itself to rocks underwater. Can you imagine like a water-resistant uh -huh. glue that has like gigantic force? You could use that in space. The problem is... I never thought about that. <laughs> it's, got, it's the kind of random shit you, you learn at my job and I fucking love it. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so glues in space. Uh, second problem with glues, when they burn, also really harmful toxic chemicals. When you burn proteins, it just smells like burnt hair, which is admittedly not a nice smell, but you know it's not going to kill you, right? Uh, so there's actually this intermediate step for like, we could make space glue. It's not too expensive, but it's also like not dirt cheap. Has like a pretty um, interesting use case, really good marketing. The problem is the time to the time to market for this is like 15 years, like because, <laughs> you know, it's space industry. <laughs> so yeah, there's like a lot of materials we don't really think of on a day-to-day -day basis that actually can help us get down to replacing commodities with sustainable alternatives. That's the short story. Yeah, that's like sci-fi things we talked about. It's like crazy. It even rockets, you know, you end, up, you end on rockets at the end being like... No, I was just expecting you to say like, oh, well, turns out you can make glue by <laughs> the same process as making beer. beer. <laughs> but you just replaced... One molecule in <laughs> the third step. At the end step. of the day, that's what it would be, right? Like we take our we take our bug, we remove the DNA that produces the collagen, put the glue DNA, and just ask it, "Can you make glue, please?" Downstream processing would be a bit wonky, but yep. at the end of the day, that's how it would that's how it would turn out, right? Oh, I love it, dude. Well, this has been awesome. I think we've taken up a ton of your time. We got to end it there. But uh, for anyone that wants to learn more about what you are doing, I encourage them to check out the links in the description about Cambrium. You all hiring right now? <laughs> there we go. If you ever, if you want to go su save the world and work with Pierre, soon. That's when it's <laughs> happening. And I think we'll call it there. Yeah, thanks for organizing.
Hey, I'm Vishnu. I'm a data scientist at First Hand, and I definitely think that you should subscribe to the MLOps Coffee Sessions podcast. It's the best podcast out there to stay on top of what MLOps actually is, to talk to the true thought leaders in the space. And oh, by the way, Demetrios is absolutely hilarious. What a weird guy. You should definitely subscribe to the podcast.